assuming it's this way for good reason as well. So I'm not going to change it. So it's six o'clock, so why don't we begin? Um, we're going to begin this afternoon with a prayer, and we're going to use our, our prayer for our meditation today, the um, gospel passage for today. And you will recognize it. It's the passage from the gospel according to St. Luke, the road to Emmaus event. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. It happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The thing that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, of how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping you would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, had astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but them they did not see. And, they, and he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. And so he went in and stayed with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us, as he spoke to us on the way, and opened the scriptures to us? So they went out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And in many ways, I think this reading, or this episode of the events on the way to Emmaus, crystallized for us the life of faith. And so I wanted to tease out that passage a little bit. Right? How was Jesus present to them? The most obvious way, right? most notable to them, is in the breaking of the bread. Right? And Luke's vocabulary and his word choice is not accidental. Right? So they sat down together at a table. He took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and then give. And we hear that Luke echoing the writing of St. Paul, 
the writing of Matthew and Mark of the Last Supper account. And each time that we celebrate Mass, we do the exact same action. Right? We take the bread, we offer it in thanks, then we break it, and then we give. But, so it was in the breaking of the bread that they recognized him. Finally, they recognized him. But, but where else should they have recognized him also? In essence, for us, when we gather as God's people, how is Jesus manifested to us? Particularly when we gather to worship in many different ways. Right? What are some of the ways? In the scripture, right? The word of God is the presence of Jesus in the scripture, in the word of God, correct? Right? He's present in us, in the people assembled, right? By virtue of our baptism, that Jesus' spirit dwells within each of us. Hopefully he's present in the minister, right? And his priest is a manifestation of Christ to us. Right? Christ is present to us in the poor, in the imprisoned, in the marginalized. Christ is also present to us in the prayers that we speak. Christ is present to us. We, like those disciples on the way to Emmaus, that Jesus is present to us most obviously in the breaking of the bread when we come together to celebrate the Eucharist. And so be, a, be attentive to all these ways in which Christ is present to us. And then notice that last request. After they had arrived in a mass, and he was present to them in the break of the bread, what was their request when he was about to indicate that he was moving on? Right? Remain with us, Lord. Remain with us. And in the Eucharist is Christ's response. Right? That God desires a relationship with us. And so as a result, you know, God's always trying to find different ways in which God is present to us. And this is our, our Lord's response to be with us. Because imagine, imagine what a desolate and lonely world it would be without the presence of Christ. How would sustained without the presence of Christ until he comes again. Imagine. Right? And, and what are what are the miracles? What are the miracles about Catholicism in Japan? Is it? That it barely survived. It barely survived for 200 years. For 200 years. They didn't celebrate the Eucharist. No, just, just, just contemplate and imagine that. And so the Lord, in response to the disciples, remain with us, Lord. Remain with us. So some terms for us tonight as we enter into this discussion about the Eucharist and the worship of the Eucharist outside of the context of the Mass. Eucharist, a Greek word, right? meaning an act of thanksgiving. And that's what the people of God do when we gather to celebrate the Eucharist, is we are giving thanks to God for who God is. God is God and worthy of our praise just because of who God is. We will often hear the term mass, right? Coming from the Latin, the dismissal rite, right? The mass is in the goal. Basically, it's the commissioning, right? Of commissioning us, all of us, as disciples. 
disciples to go forth, to be evangelizers, to be apostles. Okay? Another term that, that we should familiarize ourselves with when we speak about this is liturgy. It's the public work of the church. Right? This is why we exist. This is why we exist. We gather to worship and give bright praise to God. That communion. Right? That's the purpose of the body. That's the purpose of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ is to bring us into unity. Unity first and foremost with God. Right? A God who desires deep and abiding relationship with each and every one of us. But also the important unity and communion with one another. Right? Because you've heard me say over and over again that we always live faith not in the context of individualism. It's always live in the context of community. Another term that we want to be familiar with is consecration. Right? Because when we celebrate the Mass, we make present the event of the Last Supper. Okay? And then the bread and wine is consecrated, consecrated through the very words of Jesus Christ in the action of the priest. And then the Blessed Sacrament, the, the term that's referred to of the bread and wine when it has been transformed, the substance has been changed into the body and blood of Christ. And, and then it is reserved then for later use and for worship. Well, in, in order to understand this, um, we want to place this in, these events into a context. Right? And so scripture is always a good place to start. It's a good place to start. That when we gather as God's people around this altar to celebrate the Eucharist, we rely by and large on St. Paul's, St. Paul's recording. Okay? From 1 Corinthians, this is the first account of the institution of the Eucharist. And so we rely mostly on his vocabulary. Because why? Because it's the most ancient of the accounts. And then, and then building on the writings and the teaching of St. Paul, then the gospel, primarily the, we call it the synoptic gospel, right? That Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in writing their gospel, they're by and large peering through the same lens, right? That they further them. St. Paul's theology. Well, what is that theology? Well, it's the Last Supper account, right? In which, in which Jesus celebrates with his disciples the very Jewish Passover event. But he casts that Passover event in a new light. Well, for the Jewish people, this is the defining event for them, in which God intervenes. God intervenes on behalf of his people and delivers them from slavery in Egypt into the new promise. So he delivers them and he makes of them a nation. Right? They escape from slavery in Egypt and he delivers them into Palestine and establish for them a new homeland. Right? And that events them, establish them as a new identity. And so Jesus, in the context of this Passover dinner, in this Passover supper, cast himself as the lamb, the lamb that was sacrificed. Right? But here's the thing, that that sacrifice isn't just meant for the Jewish people, for the Israelites and the Jewish nation. No, that that was to be a universal, a universal.
universal event for all people of all time. Not, not only for, for the Israelites, but also for the Gentile. Not only for those Israelites in that particular context, but no, it dates all the way back to the patriarch, to Abraham and Isaac, and to the prophets, but also for future generations to come. Right? That that one sacrifice is meant to be universal for all time and all place. Right? And then the Gospel of John, the last Gospel to be written, then furthers, furthers this theology. And the interesting thing about St. John's Gospel is, is he doesn't have an institutional narrative. Like, he doesn't He's not so much concerned with the, you know, Jesus taking the bread, offering thanks, breaks it, and then give. No, instead for St. John, he takes a different perspective. Right? So instead of the institutional narrative, he speaks about the washing of the feet. That's why on Holy Thursday, on Holy Thursday, in addition to the Eucharist that we celebrate, we also celebrate that rite of the wash of the feet. That the two goals hand in hand. And then John develops his theology further in the bread of life discourse. Right? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, you will not have life within you. And, and so, so all these, all these scripture gives us a little glimpse of what is happening. Well, our catechism, right? Always, when we, when we speak about the Eucharist, you will hear over and over again that it's the source and summit. It's the source and summit of all that we do. And here, here's, here's what we mean by that. And in the early church, um, in the early church writing, what we as a people of faith should happen is that as soon as Eucharist is completed, our hearts and minds should be yearning for the next time in which we celebrate Eucharist again. Okay? That, that, that's why we speak about the source and summit of the faith is that everything that we do to lead to the Eucharist, everything we do should lead to that Eucharist. And then from the Eucharist that we celebrate and that we are fed from that altar, then we are sent forth. We are sent forth from the grace that we receive, then to have an impact in the world. And then we harvest all the fruits of our efforts in the world and then we bring that back. And offer that up to God in our celebration of the Eucharist. That it should be an interconnected loop. Right? Because if we divorce ourselves, if our celebration of the Eucharist within the context of these four walls are divorced from what we do out there in the world, then our celebration is insufficient. Then there's something lacking in that. Right? And then if what we do in the world never invades itself, never brings it back into the context of these four walls, then there's something insufficient about our living. <laughs> because if the two are divorced from each other, then our worship is insufficient. If our worship never makes its way out into the world, then our living is deficient. Right? That, that within the, the Eucharist, there must be a demonstration of unity. Right? Because the purpose of the Eucharist is to align ourselves closer to God. Right? It is, it's meant to, to loosen our grip from sin so that we may become 
holier. And then the Eucharist that we celebrate down here, if we celebrate it well, should connect us to the heavenly banquet. Right? That, that when we celebrate the Eucharist, in essence, we place ourselves in that betwixt and in between. That we should have one foot firmly planted here on earth and then one foot planted in heaven. That in the celebration of the Eucharist, we get a glimpse, we get a glimpse of what it means to be God's people in adoration of God. Right? Because that's, that's our belief of what heaven is. Is that one day we will be among the saints and the angel in giving fitting worship to God. Right? And so what we do here gives us a glimpse into that. That what we do here, we unify ourselves to the heavenly realm. That we probably don't see them, but what, when we celebrate Eucharist, the angel and saints of God joins us in that celebration right here, right now, and connects us to that heavenly realm. Right? Uh, for those of you who are sci-fi geek, like myself, right? uh, the, the Eucharist is kind of like a wormhole. Right? That wormhole that connects us in the here and now with, with a couple ways. It connects us in a couple ways. One, it connects us with the heavenly liturgy that's happening at all times forever. And then it also connects us to that event of 2,000 years ago on Calvary. Right? When Christ died and offered himself once and for all. And, and so, so, so looking back, making that event present to us, and then we're looking forward and what it means to be in union with God. Right? And then it's a sum and summary of our faith. Right? It's the perfect prayer. It's the perfect sacrifice made once, now being realized and pres present to us here. Right? That, that that one sacrifice, once again I said, was universal. Right? That that one sacrifice of Christ at Calvary then ransom all the faithful before Christ. And then ransom all the souls after him. A couple of things. We, wanna, we talk about institution, right? Institution narrative is, um, is what I was rolling on and on about. About um, St. Paul being the first one to write on that narrative, followed by the not synoptic gospel, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, what does it do? That institution of the Eucharist then casts that Passover event in a completely different light. We understand it completely differently than our Jewish brothers and sisters, right? For them, they're still yearning. They're still waiting for that Messiah. They're still waiting for that salvific event. But for us, for us, we understand Jesus as the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the promise anointed one of God. Right? The, the, the Eucharist we celebrate then not only the memorial of Christ's death and resurrection, but the fulfillment and the making present of that fact. And then once again, it gives us a, glim a glimpse into the future reality. Okay. And then 
and then particularly in St. John's account of this institution there, 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 he gives us a service aspect to it in his emphasis on the washing of the feet. Right? That, that what I have done for you, you shall now will do for one another. And then in the Eucharist also gives us that pledge of glory. Right? And, and we, we pray that the Eucharistic prayer, as we receive from this altar the sacred body and blood of your Son, let us be filled with every grace and blessing. Right? That, that God's grace is, is poured out upon us. Right? That we participate and we anticipate our union in the life of God. That also, this pledge of glory, we call it the vocabulary that we put around it is viatica, right? That it not only sustains us for our journey here on earth, but it also sustains us for the next aspect of our journey into eternal life. Then we celebrate it as a sacrament and also as a sacrifice. Right? So, so we always hold those two things in tension. That we celebrate as a meal and we also celebrate as a sacrifice. Right? And I'll be honest with you, in the tradition of the church, there's been time that we have um, placed emphasis in different times of the sacrament, the communal meal. Um, has been de-emphasized. Um, my sense of it, the last 40 years or so, particularly in the Church of the United States here, the emphasis has been on the communal meal. And uh, we have de-emphasized the, the sacrificial aspect, the sacrifice. But in order to have a good theology of the Eucharist, one always want to hold both of those in tension because both of them are important. Right? Both of them are important. Here, here's, here's what I mean when I say that both of them are important. If we step over a homeless person or someone in need without any regard, without thinking twice about it, on our way into the celebration of the Eucharist at church. There seems to be something wrong with that. It, it should strike us as there is something wrong with that. Right? If, but if we spend all of our time, all of our time, working at the food shelf, You know, doing all these things, going down to caring and sharing hand, without any reference to prayer and Jesus, well, there's something lacking in that also. Right? Not, not to say, not to say that coming to church and praying and praying well, that's a good thing. Right? But we come to church and to pray well while at the same time neglecting the needs of the poor and marginalized. At the same time, if we're always out there working with the homeless and the poor and the marginalized, that's a good thing. But it has no reference to God's grace and God's mercy then there's something lacking there also. Then the celebration of the Eucharist at Mass, so, so just, just a quick primer, right? We all know this, that in the celebration of the Eucharist, then we make present the Paschal mystery, namely Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. Right? We make that event present to us here. And we do it through our celebration, our liturgical rites. The breaking of bread, always done within the context of community. Here, here's what I mean by that. For example, on my day off, if 
by celebrating Mass without the congregation. I, I don't celebrate that Mass all by myself. Even though I don't have a congregation gathered physically here with me, I'm always celebrating within the context of community because the saints and angels of God celebrate, participate in that Eucharist with me. Right? That whenever we make presents, that event of Calvary, we join ourselves to that heavenly liturgy. Right? That, we, that we gather as one body. And, and we see this manifest in all souls. Because the scripture tells us that be, before you come to offer sacrifice, if you know that you have no faults against each other, make sure you handle that before you come and offer your sacrifice. Otherwise, your sacrifice isn't worthy. Right? Um, in the tradition of the church, nowadays, um, we do the sign of peace right before communion. Right? In the history of our liturgical, liturgical celebration, that sign of peace happened a little sooner than where it is now. In fact, when uh, Benedict was Pope, he had asked for that right to be examined, to see if there's a, a more fitting part of the liturgy where the sign of peace should uh, take place. Right? But, it's, it's, but the Eucharist, one of the, one of the grace of the Eucharist is to help strengthen our communion, our unity with one another. Right? That, it, that it should transform us. But, but not only to one another, but for the whole world. Right? Because, because Christ's mystery, Paschal mystery, is not just meant for the faithful, it's meant for the whole world. Right? So therefore, union, union with Christ, is one of the most important graces that we receive when we celebrate the Eucharist. The growth in our spiritual life. Right? That when we receive the Eucharist, well, it should distance us from sin. Right? That it should unify us. Then the purpose of Eucharistic adoration is to prolong, to prolong what we celebrate at the Mass. Right? So, so one of the ways we do that is in adoration. Um, it's a good habit. Uh, there was uh, Fulton Sheen that recommends that all Christians should dedicate a time <coughs> of the day to be set aside, to be in communion with God. You know, the term that, that we put around that is a holy hour. Okay? That to carve out a specific time set aside to be in union with God. Another way that we do Eucharistic adoration is benediction. Right? When we gather and we place our Lord in a monstrance, and then we are blessed with the blessed sacrament. Right? That the sacrament, we, we call that the sacrament is exposed, as opposed to when it is placed in the tabernacle as we have it now. We reserved the sacrament. So the practice of reservation. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. That for us, for us and our Protestant friends, uh, we have a different, uh, we have a different understanding of it, and it's a point of division, to be honest with you, because for us this. Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is worthy because why? Because we recognize the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And by and large, our Protestant friends do not recognize that. Right? 
and that we reserve the Blessed Sacrament so that we might bring Christ present to those who are not able to come here. So it was the Justin Martyr okay, that uh, in the earliest days of the, of the church we see this, that the Eucharist was reserved and was taken out to the ill, not to those who were not able to come to church, the prisoners. And then later the tradition that when the church was persecuted, okay, that um, the faithful could not gather to celebrate the Eucharist, then, then the Eucharist was reserved and taken out almost in secret to those who could not come to celebrate. And then it was um, the practice in France, primarily, is where it started, where the bishop would show their communion with one another, that they would consecrate the Eucharist, and then that Eucharist would be taken to other churches, certainly to the churches of that diocese, but also to other dioceses, to show our union with one another in a physical way to manifest our union with one another. And, and to be honest with you, there has been some time in the tradition of the church where the where the veneration of the Eucharist was divorced from the celebration of Mass. Right? Almost to a superstitious standpoint. Yeah, in fact, in fact, that there's some, there's some history of that, that, uh, that uh, one of the Christians was reprimanded because of his great uh, reverence of the Eucharist that he desired to have it with him all the time even taking the Eucharist with them into the circus. And, and we continue to do that, and we kind of have a resurgence of it again. About 50 years ago, the devotion kind of lost favor. But in the last 20 years ago, or so, the church is becoming increasingly um, recapturing that tradition of venerating and worshiping in front of the Eucharist you know, outside of Mass. So how do we do it? A couple ways we do it is with benediction. Right? When we expose the Eucharist for prayer, and then at the end of the prayer, we are blessed with the Eucharist. We do it in very, in various ways. Here in the United States, we genuflect to the Eucharist. Um, when I was back in Vietnam, we don't have a practice there of genuflecting. Instead, we go for pow pow. Because of my habit here, I'm so used to it, I would genuflect and people would look at me like, what are you doing? But, but here, here in, in the West, you know, that's how we show our reverence for the reserved Eucharist in the tabernacle. We do it with Corpus Christi procession. For those of you who are of a certain generation, you probably remember the 40-hour devotion. Right? Uh, for many parishes in the diocese, we do it with perpetual adoration where the Blessed Sacrament is exposed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, some, some implication, theological implication, right? Well, we do this because we recognize the real presence of Christ, right? And then that real presence is a permanent change. Right? It's a permanent change. It's not just a symbol for us. 
and we do it so that the Blessed Sacrament is available for those who cannot come to church. And in, in, in some ways, our, our understanding, our theological understanding of the real presence is different from our Protestant friends. For example, our Lutheran friends believe in the real presence, but in a different way. That that real presence is a permanent, right? That when the, when the faithful are gathered, that Christ is there, but afterwards, then the substance changes back. So, so for us then, for us then, we have this devotion as a way of enfleshing our belief in the real presence of Christ. Well, then how, how do we go about worshiping our Lord outside of Mass? One of the ways is through worthy communion service. And we come together to celebrate a word service. We read the scripture and then we distribute communion. The best example of that would be what we do on Good Friday. Right? That no Mass is celebrated on Good Friday ever. Right? Instead, we have the word and communion service. We do that in the Viagra to bolster and give strength to those who are finishing their earthly journey. And we prepare them by giving them Christ as they exit from this life into the next. We do that by exposition and benediction, by Eucharistic procession. A couple things to recognize that, that as worthy is to worship our Lord outside the context of the Mass, it pales in comparison. Right? Mass is always more important. Therefore, when Mass is celebrated, the expectation is that adoration, Eucharistic adoration outside of Mass would be suspended so that all can gather to celebrate the Eucharist. Right? A couple of norms to be aware of that for, particularly for benediction, that there need to be a prolonged period of prayer. It would be inappropriate to expose the Blessed Sacrament just for the purpose of blessing ourselves with the Eucharist, just to celebrate benediction. Right? That, that the worship of the Eucharist outside of Mass should be a regular practice in the life of, of the community. Right? So much so that it's recommended that solemn exposition should happen at least once a year in every worshiping community. Well, the purpose, the purpose of Eucharistic adoration, of worshiping our Lord outside of the Mass, so that it will prepare us to encounter our Lord that much better within the context of the Mass. So, some personal experience. Um, I, I read this story and I was struck by it. Um, this was in a, a little community in South Carolina. Right? That the alarm goes off at 2.30 of the morning. So this particular woman, she signs up for three hours a week and drags herself out of her bed at 2.30 of the morning so that she could be in the adoration chapel for her time at 3 a.m. And the reason why she does it is I come to visit and talk with my friend. I listen a lot and ask him questions. And he always gives me his peace. Because that's oftentimes, um, and I'll, I'll give you quite a list of, well, Father, what do we do when we come to worship our Lord and the Eucharist outside of Mass. A couple of things to avoid, right? As good Catholics, we want to avoid the extremes. Okay? So one of the extremes is that we become so busy, you know, you come
come in there with a stack of books. Huh? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I get through all these prayers in the next hour that I spend with the Lord. Right? So we want to avoid that extreme. The other extreme that we want to avoid is that you know it would be inappropriate for me to think or say or do anything that would distract my attention from the Eucharist. I'm going, going to come in there and for the next 60 minutes, my mind and my attention span will be completely focused on the Lord and nothing else. I have news for you, my friends. We are not angels. <laughs> now, that's putting, that's placing a pretty high And so we want to avoid those two extremes. Well, so what are some of the things that we can do? A good, a good starting point is to understand that our Eucharistic adoration is to linger over the mystery that we celebrate at Mass. And so kind of have that in mind. Well, what is it then that we do at Mass? And to have that in mind is a framework on how we should approach the worship of our Lord outside of Mass. That everything happening at Mass is appropriate, right? So we start with an act of repentance. You know, to call to mind our sins so that we can celebrate the liturgy well. And then we listen to God's Word in the Scripture. And then we offer praise and thanksgiving to God in the Gloria and in the Eucharistic prayer. And then we ask, we pray petitionary prayer in the prayers of the faithful. Right? We ask God to intercede for not only ourselves, but for all these other things, for all of God's people. And then finally, we receive the Lord and rest in His presence. We enjoy union with God. And so, if you kind of have that framework in mind, that's an appropriate approach to how we come to celebrate adoration. Yeah. You know, maybe we come and do an examination of conscience. Gosh, I wish I would have done that better, that better, that better. No, Lord, help me to do those things better. Right? To call to mind, Lord, I'm thankful for this blessing, that blessing. Lord, thank you for your presence manifested to me in this difficult situation. Thank you for helping me to make the right choice in this happenstance. Lord, I come to you this day because, you know, my family's in need of this. My co-worker is in need of that. Right? To offer intercessory prayer. And then, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate is, is one day, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not there. But prayer for me is still difficult and hard work. Still difficult and hard work. But one day, hopefully, it will be effortless. Right? That the saints, for some of them, they arrive at that point when prayer is just effortless. But ultimately, ultimately, what we're striving to do is to be at rest with God. So, a list of a lot of different ways that we can pray for the Apostle Saint. Right? To read scripture soul, Lexio Divina, we call it. To pray a rosary, that's a great prayer. Right? To talk to Jesus. And then make sure to take some time to listen also. Okay? To pray for different people, especially for our enemies. In fact, I, I find, I find, I'll speak for myself, I find that those are some of my most fruitful prayers. It, it's not so much, you know, not so much um, those prayers that I pray for loved ones and for our par parishioners. But to pray for those that really get under my skin. I, I find that those are some of my most fruitful prayers. To realize that, that we are not alone in this. Right? That, that there's a whole realm of angels and 
spend time in contemplation? And, and how does that scripture then relate to me? A beautiful section of scripture that one could use would be the psalm. Because when word escapes us, the psalmist, the psalmists are, are, and those psalms are great at putting human emotions into word. Yeah, and I think, pray for the Holy Father, for the bishop. They could use it. I'm sure they could. But you know what? Your priest, your pastor needs it more. So maybe pray for the pastor first. And then if you have time, pray for the bishop and the Holy Father. Because there's all kinds of people praying for them. Fast. Well, I take that back six minutes. 